because as, uh, unfortunately we could not continue going to the challenges with the network. So I thought in order to cover up for the time lost, it would be best to do this recording post so that everyone of you can look up and listen to the lectures, make preparations ahead of the examination. So like we are saying before, the network issues happen. This lecture would be a continuation of our lectures of the last two weeks, which we discussed elaborately on the recruitment. Uh, because of that, we gave explanations as to the relevance of recruitment, the reason why organizations conduct recruitment, the vacant positions to ensure that the right caliber of staff are employed to manage positions of authority. And we looked at certain aspects. First, recruitment and promotions within the service, and recruitment and promotions of persons outside the service, and how they become members of the mainstream uh, civil service or public service, as the case may be. Well, you need all boils down to having the right caliber of persons with the right levels of exposure, the right trainings and orientations to man positions of authority within an organization. In furtherance of that, we shall be looking at the very vital aspects of what administration and organization entails, which is the aspect of trainings that we shall be looking at in today's uh, topic of discussion. I have said that I will be sharing my screen with you so that you have a fair idea of what is expected of us. Now we have said here that administrative activities are no longer simple. They have become so complex and specialized that mere common sense is not enough to carry them out. Besides, the nature of administrative activity is constantly changing. Hence, there arise the necessity of both in service and post entry training. However, training had not been given due importance to recently. In the words of Negro, even now, it is still generally considered one of the lesser developed areas of public personal administration, one in which much remains to be done. If you look at this statement closely and you cast your minds back to the lectures we have had so far, you would understand from our very first topic on the origins and the history of administration uh, to the fact that uh, modern day administration requires some measure of complexity and sophistication. And modern day administration is a feature of the simplistic nature of administration that Itato was to practice. So if you compare that side by side with what the statement is saying, you would understand clearly that administration in modern day practice requires some measure of complexity. It is no longer the simple arrangement where common sense helps way. Modern times requires a lot of rigorous exercises and activities that comes with some measure of expertise and professionalism. And those expertise and professionalism can be gotten through in-depth training and exposure of the right principles and practices that are required within the confines of an administrative system. Having said that, it is expected that at the end of this unit, you should be able to differentiate between education and training, state the need for training, list the types of training, and how relevant they are to modern day practice of administration within the confines of an organization or in the broader system in itself. So having said that, the meaning of training according to William G. Top it defines it as the process of developing skills, habits, knowledge, and attitudes in employees for the purpose of increasing the effectiveness of employees in their present government positions, as well as preparing employees for future government positions. This is generally meaning it's practical education in any profession, art, or handicraft. In public administration, it means the conscious efforts made to improve or increase an employee's skill power or intelligence and to develop his attitudes and scheme of values in the desired direction. What this is saying 
is the fact that for an employee to function effectively, he must be exposed to the requisite skill, power, knowledge, and intelligence, which can only be gotten through training. As that to a large extent would enhance his levels of productivity and enhance the output of the organization when the right caliber of persons command the right positions and conduct their affairs in the right order. So, therefore, the relevance of training cannot be overemphasized, as it is equally linked to recruitment, and there are stages that are inherent in that arrangement of recruitment and training to have the qualified the number of personnel that man positions of authority in the organization. However, we get to that point as we make progress. And another important aspect of notes is the fact that people tend to confuse education and training. Sometimes you get people to say or feel that because they are educated, they have the requisite training to man positions of authority. But there is a thin line, the marketing line between these two uh, concepts. As education is not uh, synonymous of training, or it's not synonymous to training, as there are uh, two aspects that cover different uh, uh, a different array of uh, activities within an establishment. Training, for example, is more of uh, a specialized skill or knowledge that is dedicated to an individual or to an employee through the process of uh, the requisite uh, knowledge gotten through training. Uh, and as we have said here, uh, training uh, it has to it has comparatively a narrow scope. Education can be explained as the complete upbringing of the individual from the child to the formation of character and of habits and manners and of mental and physical activities. Uh, in other words, education is an all encompassing uh, activity or event. But training tends to have a narrower scope and a more focused and detailed uh, uh, spectrum that an individual is brought to speed with in terms of his function and activities within an organization. No doubt both are closely related to each other and even overlap each other. Dr. White has clearly distinguished between the two. He remarks pre entry education is intended to enable an aspirant to pass an examination or otherwise to show fitness of mind, which will make for subsequent success. By contrast, in-service training is directed towards individuals who are actually at work. Such training is a recognizable investment in long-time service. These specific objects in view is performance. So the whole uh, discussion here revolves around the fact that training are more Oriented than education. Education approaches the uh, issues of uh, exposure from a holistic perspective and it goes across the learning stages of an individual across the person's uh, across the person's life in general. Why training tends to build a person to specialize in a particular aspect and administration is one of those areas where an employee can be trained to gain effective knowledge on the internal workings of this uh, work environment. I must say that there are objectives of training as every training is uh, targeted at attaining certain uh, uh, expectations. And we say here that training plays a vital part in public administration. It is essential not only for affecting the efficiency of administration, but also for broadening the vision of the employees. He teaches him precision, makes himself reliant and independent, and develop his capacity to take decisions and arrive at judgment. Training has therefore been described as a continuous process. It enables an employee to adjust himself to the new situations and to comprehend the goals and values of the organization which he is to work. In other words, they are setting the expectations when the person undergoes certain levels of training in the world. And it boils down to the fact that the person's uh, self-confidence and reliability is improved upon by virtue of the exposure that the person gains through trainings. And the person, to a large extent, is better positioned to deploy the requisite knowledge to gain the desired level of productivity in uh, the general scheme of things. Having said that, the main aim of training are first produce a civil servant whose precision and clarity in the transaction of business can't be taken for granted. In 
that was by virtue of the levels of training that an individual and employee gains, his productivity level increases, his precision and clarity of purpose increases, and it has a way of stimulating the positive the growth of the organization and the results that are attained by virtue of uh, such exposures. Uh, secondly, it helps in attaining, uh, helping the civil servant to, to attain the task he is called upon to perform in the changing world. In other words, helps him to adjust his outlook and methods to the changing needs of new times. It saves the civil servant from becoming a robot, like mechanically perfect civil servant. He is made aware of his work and the service that is required to render to his community. It is not only, it does not only enable an individual to perform his current work more efficiently, but also fits in for other duties. It develops his capacity for higher work and greater responsibility. It pays substantial regard to staff work as the latter have to perform tasks of a routine character throughout their lifetime. So in other words, training exposes the individual beyond the routine duties and tasks that charge to perform the organization, learning new frontiers in the conduct of uh, his businesses and his uh, affairs as it relates to the requirements that the organization places on him. According to a report, large, large numbers of people spend most of their time and lives working upon tasks of the routine character. And with this human problem ever in the background for training, plans to be successful, must pay substantial regards to staff work. But the performance of certain peculiar activities pertaining to government training, when government training plays a significant part. For instance, government must make provision for training for policemen, firemen, and food inspectors, etc. Training helps the employee to become people-oriented and provocate in them respect and regard for the general public. Even Ashton Committee had observed first, nothing could be more disastrous than that of the civil service and the public should think of themselves as in two separate camps. The provocation of the right attitude towards the public and towards business should therefore be one of the principal aims of civil service trainings. Another point here is that it broadens the vision and widens the output of the employees by explaining to them national objectives and expecting them to make substantial contributions towards their realization. According to NEG, the function of training is to help the employee grow, not only from the standpoint of technical efficiency, but also in terms of the growth output and perspective which public servants need. It is vital to career service, a big step for advancement, which is assured to the employees when they join the government service at a young age. It improves the tone and adds to the quality of organization, since it enhances the efficiency of the employees and develops their capacity, and the efficiency and prestige of the department goes up. What this whole statement is trying to explain is the fact that training adds quality to the inputs of the staff in an organization. It emboldens the staff to carry out these activities, activities more effectively. And in the aspect of professionalism or jobs that require a high degree of proficiency, training helps to position and reposition the staff towards greater height and greater productivity. And in the end of it all, they help to better the performance and the results that are gotten from such an organization when the duties and responsibilities of such an organization are measured. In other words, training is a great level of exposure that every staff and every uh, employee of an organization is required to have as it helps them grow through the ranks and perform better in terms of the conduct of their affairs. It fosters homogeneity of output and the spirit of cooperation in the employee. It had well remarked that effective organization requires effective training towards organizational goals because of the harm that may be expected when people are left to train themselves without effective guidance or support. In the case of our earlier lectures that was not recorded, uh, we discussed this issue of homogeneity from the standpoint of uh, 
security agencies, where we say that due to the level of trainings that security agencies are exposed to, they tend to have this feeling of uh, unique uh, support for one another when they meet themselves. And that is why it's easy for you to hear amongst security operatives when they meet each other, you hear expert before. And by virtue of that uh, statement alone, they understand that they have certain levels of training that tends to create a feeling of oneness among themselves. And that tends to foster more cooperation and the ease of the conduct of their activities when they come across each other. In other words, it promotes synergy in the conduct of affairs within an organization and the broader system or the broader system of things. Having said that, there are various types of training. And uh, we have categorized them broadly into two aspects here formal and informal training. And we say that informal training, even from a layman's perspective, tends to uh, be the kind of training an individual gets by virtue of the personal relationship that exists in the work environment between people. Why the formal one tends to have a more focused arrangement and tends to be resort oriented beyond the informal arrangement. Within the confines of our course material, we have said that informal training, according to the mentor, of course, in the day to day relationship of employees and superior in conferences and staff meetings, in employee newspaper and organization publications and meetings of professional associations, and in the reading and study that employees undertake at his own volition or at his supervisor's suggestion. Because such training is connected with the regular task of the employee. He can at best integrate with his own experience and thereby profit from it. Since there is no compulsion connected with it, his motivation is positive and his influence, whether good or bad, is profound. Evidently, informal training is training by doing the work, learning by trial and error, and acquiring administrative skills through practice. This type of training was adopted by the British in Nigeria. The real education of the civil servant consists in the responsibility that devolves on him at an early age, which brings out whatever good there is in a man. The varied and attractive character of his duties and the example and precept of the superior who regard him rather as a younger brother than subordinate officials. However, the success of this system depends upon certain factors his experience, seniority of the superior officer. His interest in the new entrant, consistent effort on the part of the new entrant. What is he saying is that the new entrants or the new employees in an organization have a lot to learn from the people that are already established in such an organization, even though it appears more of an interpersonal kind of arrangement, interpersonal kind of training. It is a kind of a system in the sense that. As an employee continues to carry out his day-to-day -day activities, he learns on the job by virtue of observing what others have done before, or by virtue of the kind of the communication or the social interaction that takes place on the job. And this is slightly different from the formal kind of training. Now we have said that formal training is training which is carefully conceived we arranged and conducted under expert guidance. Remember, I talked about how the format training tends to be focused oriented and it tends to be sort oriented as well as their expectations when one is uh, faced with formal training. Unlike the informal aspect, where uh, there is some measure of flexibility and some measure of uh, uh, understanding on the social uh, interaction basis uh, compared to what we have formal arrangements. It has been increasingly realized that the old thinking administration is to man or streaming is to go stand for spy. Formal training is impacted with the view to the creating activity skills by well-defined courses and proper stages in the mass career. In fact, training schemes have been multiplied through the institutions of group discussion, conferences, seminars, lectures, and workshops. Formal training is not under four headings pre entry training, orientation training, in service training, post entry training. Now we have said that pre entry training uh, tends to be more of the exposure than an individual gets in preparation for the task ahead that such an individual is to perform in the course of uh, eventually gaining the job position in an organization. Now we say the 
strong points of material thing is that preemptive training assessment applies if training imparted to the aspirants public service before the end of such service. In this sense, education imparted in schools and colleges or universities is a sort of preemptive training which fits the individual to seek all sorts of jobs. In a stricter sense, pre-entry training may take the shape of vocational or professional training at technical schools or colleges. The product of such technical institutions can be given jobs immediately after they are coming out of the courthouse of this institution. Like I said earlier, pre-entry training deals exactly with the preparation of the minds of the employees towards the tax that they will be faced with in the course of their uh, eventual appointment into such positions. And the second uh, aspect in this uh, checklist is the orientation training. And we say that orientation training aims at introducing an employee to the basic concept of his job, new work environment, organization, and its goals. In fact, the most important thing is the acceptance within the higher civil service of the reorientation towards this role. The men at the top cadre shift their attention from watching processes to measuring their impacts, from getting things done to give each citizen his due, from the technology of participation to its effect upon the general public, from utility to ethics. Orientation training is gaining importance gradually in Nigeria as well. This is with a view to keeping the rural bureaucracy attuned to the new task. The whole idea of orientation is to incorporate in the employees the right values and principles of the work environment. And it goes to prepare the minds of the individuals towards the task that they will be faced with in the course of their job. Take, for instance, the NYS scheme and then the orientation camps that people attend. It is in preparation for the task which the core members will face in the eventual uh, postings to various organizations where their services are required. So a re reorientation training is more of a, a preparation towards the actual practice or the actual roles which an individual or an employee is expected to perform. And then there is also the in-service training. In-service training, as its name indicates, is a sort of training which is impacted to the candidates on their selection to the public service. The objective of in-service training we are very well explained by the Ashton Committee in its report submitted in May 1944. Briefly speaking, this type of training stimulates the employees to make the best efforts and to improve their performance. It boosts their morale and makes them attuned to the new task of wondrous nature. And these are uh, self interest will reduce the new entrant to remove the stigma of the new club at the earliest. His old colleagues will also like him to pick up the job as soon as possible so as to lighten their body. It will save state exchequer from unnecessary expenses to be incurred on the training of the employees and a host of others. The whole idea behind the in service training is premised on the fact that as people grow on the job, they are exposed to higher levels of training, and higher levels of training also coincides with higher positions of authority in an organization. Take, for instance, when a person is employed, let's say, on grade level 8 in the public service, he is exposed to certain levels of training that is in conformity with the job prescription that he is to carry out. And as he makes progress, further trainings and examinations are conducted for such an individual to prepare his mind towards the task ahead. And when such trainings are undertaken, he lightens the burden of the duties of such a person and even to other employees as the productivity level of such an individual increases. However, there are some pitfalls with this, with this arrangement, and we have said that it may impair efficiency of administration, and also a lot of risk is involved in expecting the employees to learn by the trial and error. The administrator has become more complex and fairly specialized. As such, an employee will not be in position to equip him or her with the requisite administrative skills. It is therefore desirable that a comprehensive system of in-service training may be adopted. In the words of Professor Willow, no matter how well-grounded an employee may be in the general subject to which his work relates, there is much for him to learn in respect of the particular duties of his position. In it all, uh, the idea
care of service training is premised on the fact that as employees grow on the job, they are exposed to different levels of training that tends to position them for greater responsibilities within the confines of an organization. And we have said also that there is post-entry training. And we say post-entry training is a training imparted to the employees during the course of this service. This type of training aims at one, better performance on present work, preparation for advancement that is higher position of authority. This type of training can be given in two ways, true refresher course, self-effort administration being a complex affair. It is then better that through periodic refresher courses, employee is acquainted with the latest administrative techniques. The government may hold seminars for the purpose by inviting officials from different departments separately for a series of lectures to the employees working in their respective departments. The government may send them abroad to make on the spot appraisal of the different administrative systems. Since training is not to be treated a state affair, the employee concerned also may on its own like to add to his qualification in order to get promotion. Uh, he should be given all facilities to avail of them. What this is saying is that post-entry training requires an individual to be exposed to pressure courses. And to get to this point, you must have attained some measure of training and experiences of the job. And for greater productivity and performance, an individual is exposed to certain levels of training that could be more qualifications, or by the government or the employers exposing such a staff to greater levels of training and refresher courses to bring them up to date and up to speed with the knowledge they have gotten prior to such kinds of training. In other words, for an individual to to this point, he or she must have been exposed to standing of the roles and jobs that such a person is to perform in the course of his uh, duty. Having said that, also, it is worthy of note that for this purpose, the employee may be given study leave or full or half leave and extended leave throughout stipends or scholarship. Additional qualifications still added to his credit may be entered into his personal file and given due weight at the time of effective promotion. The importance of post-entry training is being realized even in developing democracies like Nigeria. Hence, the central government has since liberalized its policy of granting study leaves to its employees or adding to their qualifications. A good example in point within this discussion is the fact that what we are doing in National Conference, for instance, is to bring people up to the knowledge, requisite knowledge of administration and keeping at time base. And the whole idea is premised on the fact that when you gain additional qualification, you get positions for greater responsibilities and duties in your organization. Like a lot of you at the moment have your jobs already, but by virtue of the training that you are gaining now for additional qualification, when you are done with it, it's expected that you'll be promoted to higher positions of authority and you'll be better positioned to conduct your affairs and impact more positively on the uh, visions and visions and objectives of the organization where you work. Because a lot of you that come into these programs have jobs already, but for the sake of being more productive and being more relevant to the system, you come for these additional qualifications to better position you for the greater task ahead. Training in Nigeria is an aspect that has not been given adequate attention, but by virtue of the understanding that the government is beginning to have as the relevance of administration and the relevance of the conduct of the affairs of the system in its entirety, there is now emphasis on the issues of training. Now we have said that uh, training in Nigeria is time, but sadly enough to say that we have failed Peter to our training and staff development programs. The civil service training school in the states are mainly geared towards training confidential secretaries and officials in your cadres. The institutes and faculties of administration in our universities are too academic in their office and may make very little efforts to equip administrators with the tools of the managerial performance. This is not surprising since the teachers have never worked in any large organizations, let alone run one. As for the other institution, 
the administrative staff coverage of Nigeria in Badagri. The cost provided have become so diffuse that they have lost all focus and debt. Our various institutions for training managers in the public service require urgent attention to design the courses and to involve experienced managers and practitioners. It is not sufficient just to send an official for training only once in his career and give him for the rest of his life. Training as a continuous process, according to Augustus Adebayo, on very recognized. What this is saying is that prior to modern day understanding of the relevance of training, Nigeria and other less developed countries have not paid adequate attention to the issues of training and manpower development of the staff that man organizations in Nigeria. And we have said here that due to the complexity and the sophistication in modern day society, there is the need to expose employees to the requisite uh, uh, kinds of training to enhance their performance, to enhance their capability, and their levels of productivity within an organization. As such, the relevance of training to an organization or to administration in general, both in the private and the public service, cannot be overemphasized. Hence, there is the call that the government should set up more administrative and training centers to bring to speed with modern day requirements, the levels of employees that are to man positions of authority and organizations. Training has the potentials of placing people in the right positions. Like we say in Nigeria, square pegs in square holes and round pegs in round holes. So to gain the right caliber of persons, after recruitment, there is the need for adequate training and exposure to prepare them for the task ahead. Hence, the relevance of training to administration cannot be overstated. In conclusion, we said that in this unit, we have discussed training in depth, ranging from its introduction in Nigeria, we learn the meaning of training, its objectives, types, the difference between education and training, etc. Therefore, it is apt to conclude that general mental equipment is required even for imparting any specialized knowledge. Otherwise, it is apprehended that the youth might develop myopic vision and stereotyped conception. What this is saying simply is the fact that we have studied an array of uh, factors that borders around training and recruitment of personnel into an organization. And the hallmark of training is to better position people to take positions of authority and responsibility in an organization and in the long run, enhance productivity and effectiveness of the organization as the caliber and quality of personnel an organization has to a large extent that means the levels of productivity and performance of each organization. In summary, therefore, general education broadens the outlook and widens the mental horizon of young men. Men who distribute themselves in their youth above their contemporaries almost always keep to the end of their lives the knowledge which they have gained. Public education, however technical it may be, does require the services of men with wider output and broader vision. The whole idea of gaining broader vision and wider output can only be brought through effective training and through the requisite kinds of training that would expose the employees to positions of authority that are relevant to the performance and productivity of the system in this entire So having said that, uh, this is an arrangement to cover for the times that have lost, for the lectures that were not recorded. And uh, if you listen to it and you have any questions, I am already on your WhatsApp and you can do well by asking your questions on the WhatsApp platform, and I will respond to them as much as possible. So thank you.